This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Our guest is a mind-boggling entertainer, and here to introduce him, my co-host, the mind-numbing Michael Riedel of the New York Post. You have some pretty good introductions uh, from time to time, Susan, but that's that one, of the one of them, yes. The mind-numbing, <laughs> thanks a lot. It makes me sound like a real live wire here. Uh, I may be mind-numbing, but uh, our guest tonight is certainly not mind-numbing. And if you have been fortunate enough to get to the Lyceum Theater on Monday nights to see his show, it is Mark Salem's Mind Games on Broadway. He is, um, I guess, the way I like to think of you, Mark, is uh, not a magician, uh, not a trickster, but a, a studier, an analyzer of human nature and human behavior. That and a purveyor of mind games and a uh, fun guy. Yeah, it's, well Mark, welcome <laughs> back to Theater Talk. Delighted to be here. I'm always happy to see you. Uh, I think of you as my own discovery well, since I interviewed in many you many ways, years ago off Broadway. In, in many ways you, uh, I am mm -hmm. your discovery. And now you're a celebrity, so thanks well, for coming As are back. you. Um, all right, your show is, <laughs> thanks, cute Mark. Uh, I recognize that you uh, read behavior. The body language. <laughs> <laughs> I can read body language too, thank you very much. Uh, this show is full of tricks that really leave the audience um, gasping and astounded. And the question always is, well, how do you do that? I mean, how do you stop someone's watch? How do you know if someone is going to pick a number or, or select um, uh, something that you have in an, an envelope uh, that they know, do not know is there? And I know you don't give these things away, but is it fair to say you're a manipulator as well as a reader of human behavior and Absolutely. you can lead people to conclusions you want them to draw? Yeah, a m manipulator may have a bit of a negative connotation. A guider <laughs> may be a little better. But that's the point. We put power into words and I use words very, very carefully. Mm -hmm. So indeed, I uh, am guiding, I'm twisting, uh, 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 um, using virtually any technique possible for me to make the audience respond or for me to understand them. Other than, again, I don't use stooges. Mm -hmm. I don't have any hidden electronics in the theater. If you knew the budget, you'd understand. <laughs> <laughs> no devices like apparently people like the amazing Kreskin used to have, you know, well, yeah. the, the we, plants in the audience who would have a well, microphone. Well, I used to use plants, but that was in the 60s. <laughs> but not that anymore. was then. <laughs> so, so when you are min guiding people, is it sort of like you're just laying a path for them to follow? Sometimes. Now, now, to me, I'm working with logic for, to a great extent, and by that I mean I'm hoping my audience thinks logically, mm -hmm. um, and therefore A follows B follows C, and I'll sometimes bring in Z, X, and Y. Mm -hmm. So I am certainly expecting people to behave the way human beings behave. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody who's drunk, someone who can't focus, someone who's unclear, sometimes children, although some children think more c clearly than adults. But I do find the most amazing to me is that this is cross-cultural. I've traveled around the world, and virtually the show works in every single con country. And I think what that tells me is how common people are to each other, okay? The similarities are overwhelming. Now, we all laugh when something's funny, mm -hmm. all right? Now, it doesn't mean we always laugh at the same time. It also means that sometimes there are certain traditions who, who, who laugh at a funeral, mm -hmm. okay? And that's part of their culture. I mean, you could even see it in New, New Orleans. But the laughter still means happiness, okay? You may think it's inappropriate because of its context. There it means this person went through their life and we're happy about it. Right. Nowhere does a smile mean I'm sad. Yeah. All right. So the human emotions, the basic affect displays, the ways we use our voices, that I have found across the world. But how, uh, this show has been phenomenally popular. You've gone really all over the world. In fact, I think you told me you're traveling for 18 months. Um, Part of the enjoyment of the show is you're a very witty fellow. I mean, you know, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen up there. And your little asides, your jokes are quite good. Does the show lose something, though, when you have an audience that doesn't speak English and it's strictly visual? I think, again, I use body language to make the humor. I make the audience feel welcome and concerned. And I think there's also, by the nature of what I do with a smile, um, when something occurs, people laugh. There's almost that Hitchcockian relief Mm -hmm. suddenly, oh, this is over. Because I don't build suspense a great deal. I want it to be every man. I want everyone to feel comfortable. But yeah, my, my one-liners are sometimes difficult to translate into Spanish when I uh, mm -hmm. have a translator. And for the most part, I do speak six languages, so uh, I do come up with some ways to use that, that uh, back and forth with the audience, because I love that. I mean, yeah. to, to, you know, meeting somebody you've never met before, they're on stage, now's a moment, and just to have fun and enjoyment. And again, they're never the butt of the jokes. I mean, the butt of the joke is always right. me. I right. mean, they are my audience, and they're treated with uh, absolute respect. Well, most of them seem sometimes terrified at some of the, uh, the things you do to them. Right, and I yeah. need them to feel comfortable. Now, in all, 
all the people you brought up on stage, and, and I know you're, you're a psych psychologist, yes. psychiatrist, Psych um, and you're, of course, a very sharp observer of human behavior. Have you ever had some people that you brought up where you've sort of looked at them and there's something really very <laughs> strange and <laughs> unnerving and disturbing going on here? Only three times, believe it or not, in thousands of performances have I called up people who, who just were wrong. And, and once it was somebody who was obviously under some strange substances, mm -hmm. um, and I did send them back. There was once I called up a woman, and she seemed fine, and I said, hello, what's your name? And she says, uh, Judy Garland. <laughs> and then she starts this riff on how I look exactly like her second husband. And she's going on and on and on. And I find out after show that she, she was a schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. uh, but I worked with her as Judy Garland. I mean, I basically, you know, had her sing Over the Rainbow and did, did some uh, <laughs> stuff with her and then sent her back to her seat. So, so while it was unnerving for me, I, I always treat the audience, again, with respect because I need the audience to feel that they're safe. Right. And uh, the third person... Uh, was, was uh, again, it was a psychiatrist. <laughs> They're who, the weirdest um, of the lot, aren't yeah, they? <laughs> who, who, who just was off two beats mm. um, and, and everything. But other than those three people my entire life, now, even hecklers, I really have no problem with hecklers because, again, I make the jokes about myself, which basically cuts off anything they could say. Right, right. I do remember one night there was a gentleman in Edinburgh who um, w w started to heckle. Okay, and I had him stand up, come up on stage, and I said, reach inside my pocket. He reached inside his pocket. I said, unfold it. And it said, the man in the black leather pants is going to make a fool out of himself. <laughs> and he looks down, and he's wearing <laughs> And he quietly walked back <laughs> into his seat. Now, do you get some people, though, with a little attitude to think, I'm going to figure this out, and they're resisting you in some way, and they're, they're trying to guess what you're doing? I and find that happens within the first 10, 15 minutes, and then basically people say, this is too much. I'm sitting back and enjoying yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is... A lot of effort, and suddenly you begin to realize, I'm missing a show. Yeah. I'm missing the entertainment. So, look, those people come back again and again and again, um, and uh, th they enjoy that aspect of it. But th th suddenly they're enjoying watching how their friends are now responding to the show, and parents bring grandchildren. Um, it it's become a very family kind of sort of thing. And I see people year after year come back. Yeah. Um, you brought, or we brought some props, actually. Yeah, we're here. gonna try. Uh, uh, this shows you with, uh, how this huge budget of yours, paperbacks and a, a, a blank piece of paper there. All right. But uh, now this is. We should tell people at home that we haven't practiced this. No, no, no. And no. we're doing this sort of live now, so there's no editing here, right, Susan? Tape there's does no, live, yes. The ta right. Tape does live, so right. here we go. All right. Um, I don't use any stooges, as you know. I didn't work out anything. No, I did have you make a drawing of something. Yes. I said, go off to another <laughs> room, have nobody look and see what it is that you're drawing. I had you take out a book uh, from your bookcase. Okay, you could just uh, take the book that you brought out. You pick it up. All right. And I'm going to try something a little odd, a little strange, something that, that, that may involve some sensitivities. How many pages does that book have? Uh, this book has 530. That's 530 is the, pa the last page of the book itself, and there's okay. some extra pages here blank. All right, this has Omer 187. Okay. Um, We'll begin with Susan. Just say stop at any point. Stop. All right. What page is that? Over there. Okay. Shall Look I tell you? Page. Look at that one over yes. there. Yes. What is it? 150. Okay. Turn to page 150 in your you're, book. You're dealing with an unstable mind here, Mark, yeah, so it okay. might, not, <laughs> <laughs> might not work out. <laughs> okay. Turn to page 150 in your book. Okay. Now, you two haven't discussed anything about this either, correct? Uh, no. Certainly okay. not. All right. Look at the first word or two on that page. Have you got it? Yeah. Okay. Shut the book. Okay, Susan, take out your drawing. You made a drawing backstage. Okay. You, shall I open the envelope? Not yet. Nope. All right, I'm just going to um, think of your first letter, of your first word. Just look at me, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. First letter's a B? Excellent, okay. All right, visualize your drawing. I'm getting a B. Is there B significance in yes. your drawing? Yes. Another B. Yes. Coincidence? It gets stranger. <laughs> Another B. So we're down to th with three Bs? Yes. Well, no, well, I don't know the third B, but... Okay.
Okay, see your second letter. Just see it over here. Say nothing loud. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, L, M, M. It's an M, an L. It's an L. See your second letter of either of your words, of either of the words, either of the words. You wrote words. You wrote words. You wrote words. Not a picture. Okay, look at me. That's a U. Is it? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Um, I'm getting one of your B's is Broadway. One of your B's is yeah. Broadway. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, that's B L B L U B L A B C A E I O U A E A E A A. Okay. All right. Um, you're thinking of black. You're thinking of black. Same color that you're wearing. You're thinking of Broadway. You're thinking of Broadway. You're thinking of um, something about Broadway. Uh, but I asked you to draw a picture. I asked you to draw a picture. You're thinking words. Think of the picture. Think of the picture. Think of the picture. Um, it's um, bloody, bloody, bloody. There's the other B. Is this a bloody picture? <laughs> this is drawing okay. me after the hatch in my head. <laughs> uh, no, she is drawing you. You did draw Michael, didn't you? <laughs> but not with a hatchet on his head. <laughs> it's what, in his hand? It's not a hatchet. It's a knife? <laughs> it's a butcher knife? <laughs> my, so, it, it, it's black clothing. Do you think of black clothing? Black clothing, and, and this is what, like the butcher Am I showing you my drive? Yeah. <laughs> Now, I should say, you had me go in another room, draw the picture, I put it in an envelope, sealed it, put it in my pocket, and I came back and you were sitting leisurely in a chair where you could not have seen me. All right. <laughs> we have Broadway, we bloody view, and black. And my word is black uniformed. Black clothing, okay, great. <laughs> well done. Now, when I was, I was trying to watch you watch me, and you have you have an ability to it's not that you're reading my mind but you are pulling out of me that letter i mean i noticed when you go through the alphabet i can't help but blink at the right letter is that part of what you see and how people but behave but it's not and just you... blinking the more one tries to resist the more likely they're going to give themselves away now yeah. again it could be a downward glance it could be a look to the left or to the right well you know. i try i tried not to blink but, later but on the and point. then when you got it i would sort of give it away on my well, well, my face particularly when ways. you try not to blink you're going to blink then on the letter after which is why basically ah. i went back and forth to two letters yeah, and then yeah, i pulled yeah. back and, and again usually there's also structures of language i know that after a consonant is probably a vowel i mean that's why I immediately moved to the vowels. Not always. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and then you, as soon as I said B, you oh, just I was brightened a up. Away. <laughs> <laughs> you just brightened up with that B, and but I just took the But it's truly amazing, though. I'm know? just on these the things. Just the way our face changes when you come across what we're thinking or the right but letter. The you thing, can see that. But so the clearly. thing to keep in mind, of course, is while this looks like an academic exercise when you go to the theater you're seeing a show you're entertained yeah. it's not a, you're not going to a lecture i mean it's important for people to understand you know sometimes i talk in, on a radio interview and people then come to the theater then i'm expecting a lecture yeah, yeah, yeah you know because and it's a, it's it's a laugh provoking jaw dropping show <laughs> where everybody who wants to participate will participate um, and, and I'm delighted always uh, meeting new people, playing with their thoughts, getting their thoughts, guiding their thoughts. And indeed, I'm, I'm in development right now with BBC to develop a TV series about the thoughts oh, and uh, mm -hmm. you know about uh, the mind. The uh, working title right now is Mind You. And that's Mind <laughs> University that's and Mind You and Mind Your Manners. Now, a lot of our viewers always sort of um, oh, write in about the relationship that Susan and I have in, as a sharp observer of human behavior. What? sort of is the dynamic that you see that goes on between us. Benign neglect. <laughs> <laughs> on whose part, Susan? Certainly the, the um, let us call it the, 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 the sense of dark prison comedy between the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like on what planet have we been now thrown together into this place? Uh, we've got to make the best of it. And therefore there, there, there's a bit of gallows, you know, uh, back and forth between the two of you. Um, underneath a lot of stuff, there's respect. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he's got a point there, Susan. That's how I feel. I have great respect for you. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> You're waiting for the reciprocal. Yes, comment. I didn't get it. Well, it some it's, people, it's there. Yeah. 
Yeah. Very deep. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The show is uh, Mind Games on Broadway. Mark Salem, it's a, it's a really terrific show. Uh, Monday nights now at the Lyceum because right. Whoopi Goldberg is right. there. But you pop up at other nights. Yeah, we'll from be time popping to time. up to other nights. I guess uh, best go to the website, you know, and uh, the theater website or um, you know, ticket site or uh, MarkSalem.com and. Uh, has it all there? Yeah. And uh, check out your paper. You're a terrific guy. It's great to see you. And uh, thanks I, for uh, I'm reading our. I'm to see you guys again. Reading our minds, our <laughs> thoughts, our relationship, which is one of mutual respect and admiration. Very deep down. <laughs> Thank you, Mark <laughs> Salem. A great pleasure. <laughs> thanks, folks. Our guest is the hardest working middle aged man in show business and gad about town, Murray Hill. Murray. Yes. When did you decide? <laughs> when did you is this decide? therapy? Yes. Where, when where did how did much are you? A hundred dollars? When did you decide to become middle aged? The hardest. Yes. When did you decide you were the hardest working middle aged man in show business? Well, it, it's a term that came to me uh, through Michael Musto coined that term. The Village Voice reporter. I, I think he's a gay kid, but a great a, guy. A, and a frequent contributor to this show. Oh, I can imagine. Yes, I'm sure yes, the ratings must go through the roof when he comes on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love you, Michael. You're great. And uh, but uh, you know, as you can see, I've got a, a very distinct look that was from the 1970s, and uh, I was just a young guy at 30. Now I'm 55, and uh, I'm middle aged. I work every night, and I'm in great shape. So that's why they call me the hardest working middle aged man in show business. Now, why? Um, how is it, Murray, that you've sort of been frozen in time and around like 1976, 77. Was that well, a, an era that has a particular um, importance in your life? And you've yeah, never that, really been <laughs> able to change your fashion sense? Well, that's that's the era, Michael, and, and I'm sure you can relate to this. I've seen you in the nightclubs in the in the evenings. Is uh, <laughs> That's the era I discovered Budweiser. And those were some good years. And I just, yeah, every single night. And I kind of just, I never quite woke up from that uh, haze. Mm -hmm. And uh, these suits, I've had them all for 35 years, and they still fit, so I'm doing great. <laughs> uh, the era of wide ties and, uh, and wide lapels. Oh, yeah, every, everything, what you're seeing here, ladies and gentlemen, and, and Susan and Michael, this is 100% polyester. Nobody does this anymore, so I'm ahead of the game. <laughs> yes. Now, your, your, your comic sensibility, is it, does it come out of, um, of the 70s as well? I mean, who are the influences in your, uh, on your act? Well, you know, I was, of course, I was good friends with Jackie Gleason. Archie Bunker? I had a, <laughs> well, Jackie Archie Gleason. Bunker, you know, he was a little, you know, he was a little crabby, I gotta say. He was a nice guy. We both shared double chins together, but, uh, you know, I'm not as uh, as bitter he is, as he is. But, uh, you know, Jackie Gleason, a good friend of mine, and, you know, we were we were tight, and we had the same little shtick, and Jack Ritter from the 70s, oh, good stuff, that guy. Jack Ritter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, three's company. You know, all the old greats, Sammy and Dean, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Shecky Green, mm -hmm. and Benny Hill, which everybody thinks we're related, but we're not. But we, mm -hmm. you know, we have some similar looks, and you know, I do love the ladies like that. But your timing, your, 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 your comic timing seems to be in that sort of Catskill uh, sort of delivery, that, that, that type of comedy. Yeah, you know, I, I did a couple of gigs at the Cats, Catskills, and I was up at the Poconos a few weeks ago. I mm -hmm. actually was. So, was. Susan, I know you're laughing, and a lot of people laugh when I talk about my career. I understand that. But, uh, <laughs> no, I've done the Catskills and the Poconos and, you know, all the B-list places you can imagine, and, and now I'm at Fez. So it's a real big break for me. And when did this whole... Um enterprise of Murray Hill really, really come together? I mean, what was the inspiration for it? Uh, I mean, you weren't always Murray Hill. You were, you've been other things in your life. Well, kid, I've always been Murray Hill from day one. <laughs> so you wanted yeah, to be Yeah, my parents didn't name me the first day. They named me the second day. So that first day, I was real confused. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so this is something... I started as a young boy. Uh, and and you, as, as a comic as well. Well, it wasn't so funny. I mean, actually, not so funny now. But, you know, we just do what we can to get gigs. But, uh, no, I was, I was five years old, and my father was working up on 52nd Street and then the, uh, at the Copacabana. That was the old, you know, the old days in the 50s where there was clubs and everything was, all the supper clubs and the speakeasies. Now I think there's um, 21 clubs, the only thing left up there. Yeah. And uh, I was five years old, and my father worked there, and I was a busboy. We had to make a, you know, a little extra money in the Hill household. And... Uh, you know, people were drinking. Jackie Gleason was the host there once a week. And uh, he got loaded one night, passed out, which he used to do a lot back in those days. With him and Toot Shore, he used to get loaded. <laughs> so I, I, was, I, five years old, and everybody's panicking. They called me up, and they said, hey, kid, get up there. I grabbed that mic, and the place went dead silent. Pretty much like how I start my shows now. Hey, folks, it's me. <laughs> and uh, it, I started cracking a couple of jokes. I played my triangle. And there was an agent in the uh, in the uh, audience that night, and I got booked to open up for Don Rickles. 
in and Atlantic City, and I did that gig for 35 years. And you've never looked back. <laughs> and I've never looked back. There's been a lot of highs, and there's been even more lows, but here I am. I had a PBS show, doing my talk show. Everything's going well. Well, you're very, you're very popular with the art world. Oh, Thank I'm popular with all the kids, especially the ladies, Susan. I know you. I know you're can popular imagine with the that. Ladies. Popular with ladies. Same age. But but but, but yes, yeah, true. We're both, we're both in our fifties. Yes. Uh, um, so, uh, but you you played the Whitney Biennial. Or, I mean, you were big at that party, and you're big at you're you're you're, you're in, in many avant garde magazines. Yeah, is, and, is this your, I've uh, even been in the Post. Indeed, yeah. on page six page a couple six of times. The, I mean, are you postmodern, Murray? The hell does that mean? <laughs> Jesus, that sounds like I gotta read something to figure out what that is. Now you're making a movie. You told me, uh, uh, not a movie, but if you keep drinking that booze, you're gonna be okay, great. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna have another hit. All right, uh, I'm in development for a TV show, a TV the, show, the Murray a Hill TV show. show. So kind of a cross between a, a talk show. Will it be a sort of talk show? Right, kind of like a little Dean Martin, a little Benny Hill, a little Dame Menna, all into one. Mm. We're gonna have bands, and you know, I'm hoping to get Wayne Newton for the first show. Now, you spend um, a lot of time uh, performing in sort of around the, I, I don't know, what would you call it, maybe the sort of avant-garde theater world, the downtown theater scene. Is it, um, in your opinion, uh, thriving or uh, is it, um, could it l use more attention? Uh, are the artists down there kind of um, not, not being paid attention to by the major critics and the major publications? Well, you know, uh, during that whole, uh, around September 11th and the theater stuff uptown was not doing so hot and probably hasn't fully recovered yet, Downtown, I think, has been thriving since then. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been every night you can go to three or four shows on Avenue A or uh, the Bowery or all this, and it's just packed. And uh, I was blown away this year at the, uh, the, the week that the Republicans were in town. I mean, downtown, was it was like a theme park. There were shows every night, hundreds of people coming out and getting loaded. I mean, it was, this whole, it was like almost a theater festival mm -hmm. for the Republic Republicans. So, you know, downtown is always kicking. No matter what, you know, because you, you, let's face it, who can pay $50, you know, to see Whoopi Goldberg when you can watch the, you know, the, is that show still open? Yeah, yes. Oh, she's doing great, I yeah. bet. Oh, good friend, good friend of mine. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, yeah, you know, hey, I make $100 a week. I, yeah, I, it's tough to go see Billy Crystal, you know what I'm saying? Now, it's strange, though, as a, as a um, uh, middle-aged straight guy critic, you have a kind of a gay following. You're very popular with the, with the gay community in this town. Do you have any idea why well, that is? Well, uh, Michael, I'm going to tell, and Susan, I'm going to tell you a little trick about theater business. Oh. Gay guys, they got money. <laughs> All right? They do. And they come to my shows, and they're pretty much, they never ask me for comps. They always pay <laughs> for the tickets, and they always get loaded. You know, two drink and forget it. And they tip like, the waiters. They tip the waiters. They, they buy, you know, my t-shirts. The, the gays are wonderful. But uh, I, I think the, the gay, and you know, the gay ladies come and all the people in between and outside of that, which we get a lot of fringe people at the shows. Uh, you know, I take anybody in. You know what I'm saying? The, the straight kids come to my shows, the tourists come, you know, the hipster kids, the artists, and then the rock stars and the gays. Everybody comes and everybody has a good time. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't discriminate. So I think that's why they come. They, they feel special. And I make fun of everybody. Now, if we're going to look for you um, uh, this year, you're uh, often at Fez. They can find your schedule on the internet where? Yes. The, I, ladies and gentlemen, I have a website. It's very exciting. And I, here's the, the double chin here. If you, uh, <laughs> that is me. And uh, the website is mrmurrayhill.com. M-R-M-U-R-R-A-Y-H-I-L-L.com. And I just spelled something at 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm impressed with myself. All right. <laughs> Go on and check out and see where Murray Hill is playing uh, in town. The ubiquitous Murray Hill, whom I run into when I can't get into clubs behind the uh, red velvet rope, and you just whisk right through. Anytime you need help, kid. <laughs> you got to stop trash and burn it at Peter's. Then they'll let you in anywhere. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> it's been a great pleasure, Murray Hill. Thanks Show for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. <laughs> So let's close now with a highlight from the press preview of the upcoming Broadway musical, Good Vibration. Okay. Okay. Okay, here we go. Thanks. It starts with five, six, seven, eight.
thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Friedrich Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Playbill Online is the official website of Theatre Talk in the home of the Playbill Club, providing information and opportunities for theatre lovers. Welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.